I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 28 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Rice proposing a matter of urgency was chosen. It's shown at item 12 in today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? The proposal is supported. I understand the informal, that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. And I call Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the matter of public urgency, which is the urgent need for the Morrison government to respect the thousands of Australians who marched in the Women's March for Justice yesterday, to take urgent action to end gendered violence and sexual harassment, and to establish an independent inquiry into the Attorney General's fitness to hold that position. It's been a rough few weeks in this place. It's been a rough few weeks for women right around the country. I mean, it's been a rough few centuries, frankly. Um, but these matters have been brought to a head in this workplace with the rape of a staffer and with allegations of a historic rape uh, by the Attorney General of a young woman. Now, sadly, we know this happens far too much, far too often in many workplaces, in many homes, on the streets. But the nation's attention is now on this matter. And there is a building momentum for justice and for equality and safety for all women. Now, that was on display so powerfully yesterday. Um, and like some of the people in this chamber, um, I went down to the Women's March for Justice. I was one of the 100,000 people across the country that did that. I felt rage, but I felt strength, and I felt hope that so many people wanted action on this most crucial issue of women's safety and our rights to equality um, and to freedom from violence and abuse. Now, I think every member of parliament should have been there yesterday, and I was extremely disappointed that the Prime Minister didn't make the effort to walk out of this building for a few minutes and to do some listening. Women are hurting and all we see is this government trying to silence us, trying to ignore us and trying to distract the political attention with other announcements that it's so desperate to talk about because it doesn't want to talk about women um, and rape us in its own ranks. Women are not going to be, be placated. We are angry and we are not going anywhere. It was a really stark contrast yesterday with women hitting the streets, young women, old women, uh, men who support women's rights for safety and, um, and equality, a whole spectrum of people, lots of really strong women of colour on the speaker's podium, lots of survivors there. Um, lots of support there. But in this place, in these halls of power, the patriarchy just wanted to protect itself. The status quo just wanted to protect itself. And that was very, very disappointing. Um, we saw when the rape allegations of Miss Brittany Higgins were first made that the Prime Minister didn't know that rape was bad until he spoke to his wife. And she had to say, well, what if this was our daughters? Now, to that I say, Women have value irrespective of our relationship to a man. And the fact that the Prime Minister needed to be reminded of that and didn't intuitively know that was really the start of, uh, I think, a national heartbreak that this guy's in charge and just doesn't get it, so deeply doesn't get it. Now, that, it's just gotten worse since then um, because he had a little chat with Minister Porter, took his word that you know, it was all totes OK didn't even bother to read the dossier from the woman that alleged that she was raped by a Christian Porter as a teenager, who's now taken her own life, who now, of course, the police can't keep the investigation open because she's not with us anymore and didn't sign her extensive statement prior to taking her own life. The system let her down, and now the system is protecting itself rather than delivering justice. For shame. 
So that's why women marched yesterday. And um, I was proud to receive two petitions, and I'll be moving a motion tomorrow um, giving voice to those petitions. But they really articulate what women want right now. It's an inquiry into not just the rapes that have happened here in parliament, but inquiries into rapes that happen everywhere. And I want to remind people of the stark statistic, because often we hear from the men, oh, why didn't she go to police straight away? Gee, she must be making it up because she didn't go to the cops straight away. It shows absolutely no understanding of the psychology of rape, and it particularly shows no understanding of the fact that the justice system lets women down at almost every turn. We know that about 10 per cent of sexual assaults are reported because women fear they won't be believed, because they know they'll be re-traumatised, they'll be discouraged from pursuing it. But of that 10 per cent, we know that about uh, 10 per cent of that, so 1 per cent of the total, actually uh, progresses to a conviction. So 1 per cent of the rapes and sexual assaults lead to a conviction. Is it any wonder that women don't seek justice more often? Because they know it's not going to be delivered. We should be fixing that. But instead, the Prime Minister is victim-blaming, is taking the words of alleged perpetrators, not even doing the dignity of reading uh, victims' and survivors' words. And he's trying to just get off this issue as quickly as possible. It's not going away, Prime Minister. I'm so pleased that some of the members of the coalition attended yesterday's march. I'm really pleased that um, folk from many other parties attended as well. But the Prime Minister wasn't there and the Minister for Women weren't there. They should have been there because those speeches were incredibly powerful. And they called for justice for sexual assault survivors. They called for action on those recommendations in the Respect at Work report, which was tabled, what, 14 months ago now, and has barely seen the light of day. I asked about how many uh, recommendations have been acted upon yesterday. I got told a number. Um, today we hear it's three of 55 that some actions have been exerted on. Well, fine, but do better. Three is not 55. Please action all of them. I'm pleased that there's now um, a particular report into sexual harassment and the culture of Parliament House that's been established and that the Sex Discrimination Commissioner will lead that and that it will cover every worker in this building, not just the staff members but the people that work in the press gallery, the people that look after the kids um, in the early childhood education centre, the people that make coffee at Aussies. I think that culture review is going to be explosive, but what I want to know is, and what I want to see is a commitment from this government or the next that those recommendations will be acted upon, because the last ones have been uh, tantamount to being ignored, and it's not good enough. So women are hitting the streets, we are raising these issues, and we don't accept a prime minister that ignores us, that doesn't get the issues, um, and that just closes ranks and stands with his privileged white men to keep their power entrenched. It's not going to fly with the electorate. I know the Prime Minister doesn't want to listen to women, but maybe he'll listen to news poll, and that's already showing that his support and the support for his party is dropping, and I suspect this is one of the reasons why. Um, women vote, Prime Minister. Um, <laughs> if that's all you care about, well, at least you can reflect on that. So we marched for justice yesterday. We will march for justice every day. We will fight for justice every day. Women belong in this building. We deserve safety. We deserve safety no matter what place we are in. And we stand united to deliver that outcome. Thank you, Senator Waters. I call Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I want to today assure all Australians that the, the Morrison government absolutely respects the thousands of Australians who yesterday attended the March for Justice. We respect their right to protest. And in particular, I want to acknowledge the bravery of survivors of family and domestic and sexual violence who have shared their personal stories. My sincere hope is the words that have been spoken by the survivors of sexual violence will create a real and lasting change to ensure every woman, young or old, is not only safe but feels safe, whether it be in their home, in, their sc in the school or in their workplace. My commitment to these women, survivors and all Australians is that I'll put every effort into doing my job in here, in this place, because I know that I have an incredibly privileged position to be able to affect change. More than 11 years ago, the first national plan to prevent violence against women and their children commenced. It was a world-leading plan, and I acknowledge those members opposite that were part of the creation of that plan. Today, along with the Minister for Women, 
I have carriage of delivery of the fourth action plan under the national plan, which seeks to end gendered violence. And we're seeing a seismic change in the discourse around the issues of family, domestic and sexual violence. This is not a conversation we could have had 11 years ago, but we are able to have it today. As a society, we know our attitudes are changing, and this has been evidenced by the evaluation and statistics, but also by the March for Justice yesterday, which occurred around the country. But there is still so much more to do. And joining with the Minister for Women in saying we are listening, we are acting, and we are looking to the future, a future free of violence. One woman is killed every nine days by a current or former partner. One in six women have experienced physical or sexual violence by a current or former partner since the age of 15. This figure increases to nearly one in four women when violence by boyfriends, girlfriends and dates are included. Of concern is the fact that one in four young people are prepared to excuse violence from a partner. Since 2013, more than $1 billion has been invested directly uh, to support the fourth action plan of the National Plan. And this develops, uh, the fourth action plan de work, uh, develops on the work done over the previous three plans. $68.3 million, or 20 per cent of the total funding, has gone to private primary prevention strategies to improve attitudes towards gender equality and stop violence before it begins. I'm incredibly proud today to be able to tell you about the $18.8 million stop it at the start, third tranche of the campaign, uh, which was launched over the weekend. It's a campaign which challenges disrespectful attitudes learned in childhood and that, if left unchecked, can escalate to violence. It's a campaign we know is having a real and tangible impact with research revealing that the first two phases prompted 42 per cent of all adults to take action to challenge disrespectful attitudes towards women. Primary event prevention must be a focus of the next national plan, but we know we can't do this standing alone. Under the fourth action plan, we committed $82 million to target frontline services, $78 million to safe places to keep victims safe uh, um, in safe places and in their own homes, $7.8 million to work with male victims and perpetrators uh, in family law matters. And also in response to COVID-19, we quickly allocated $130 million in additional funding for frontline services, as well as $20 million to boost the Commonwealth initiatives, including 1800 Respect, a national 24-7 hotline, Men's Line and to promote our Help Us Here campaign. The way I'm choosing to stand up for women is, by, women is by putting every effort into rolling out significant government investment in primary prevention, early intervention, frontline services and education. Action should unite us all, not divide us, and must be above political point scoring. As a nation, now is a pivotal time for all Australians as we publicly discuss and deal with issues around sexual violence and disrespect towards women. Only yesterday I met with the Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins to discuss these very issues. We are already implementing much of the work that Kate has undertaken with the Respect to Work program, uh, including making sure that the 1800 Respect number is permanently funded into the future. The next national plan will commence in mid-22, and we are focusing on all of the new and emerging issues that weren't in existence when we had our first plan uh, 11 years ago. What we must do is we must have a prevention focus and look towards building the fence at the top of the cliff rather than being the ambulance at the bottom. We must look to what survivors are saying and what we can do to prevent violence and disrespect at the very start. Finally, I want to put on the record that I do not support an independent inquiry into the allegations of a criminal nature. Politicians, like all Australians, have the right to the presumption of innocence. We cannot support a dangerous president to stand down an individual merely on the basis of an allegation. Thank you, Senator Ruston. I call Senator Green. Thank you. Uh, this motion does a couple of things, and um, it's important to recognise that it calls on the government to act to end gendered violence, and it also calls on the government to establish an independent inquiry into the Attorney General's fitness to hold the position of the first law officer in this country. 17 per cent of women in Australia have experienced sexual violence. 16 per cent of women have experienced sexual violence from a man who they know. Eight women have died this year alone, it's March, from violence. But it's not good enough to stand here and read out statistics as the minister just did then. It's about action and it's about leadership. And that is why this parliament is calling on the Prime Minister to show 
leadership in this space. On the issue of whether we need an independent investigation, let's be clear about what we are asking for. We have heard the Prime Minister and even the Minister just now, and I suspect some senators that will speak after me, say words like, that's a matter for the police and for the courts. It, let's leave it for the proper processes. And they try to use these legal terms, I think, possibly to say to people, you wouldn't really understand, this is a really complicated legal issue. Well, this is what members of the public understand it wholeheartedly, that police investigations and criminal court proceedings are the best way, in fact, the only way, to determine whether a person should be convicted of a crime and deprived of their liberty. That is the way to do that, to make that decision, to have that test. That is the rule of law that the Prime Minister has referred to on so many occasions. That is the proper process for a criminal conviction. But the rule of law does not prevent the Prime Minister holding an independent investigation into the fitness of the Attorney General to hold office. That is a different test. It does not determine if the Attorney General should be criminally convicted. That is not the independent investigation that members on this side of the House have been calling for. And to confuse the two issues does a real disservice to this very important issue and to the importance of the role that the Attorney General plays in our legal system in this country. The Prime Minister must give himself and Australians confidence that Christian Porter is a fit and proper person to hold ministerial office, and not just ministerial office, but the first law officer of this country. He hasn't even read the allegations that have been made against the Attorney General. So how could he possibly decide that there is no th nothing to be investigated? We know that this just won't go away. This isn't something that this government can ride out. What the marches showed yesterday is that women will not let this go, because we're not talking about one particular case. We are talking about systemic gendered violence taking place in our country. And I've seen people on the other side of politics try to say that uh, the allegations of the Attorney General are being used to um, somehow play out the other allegations that have been made against men in this country, other cases, other instances of violence. That is conflating two very separate issues. But it is important to understand why, when the Prime Minister gets up there and says things like, let the courts deal with it, let the proper processes deal with this issue, why that is insulting to victims in this country, because victims in this country know that the court processes don't actually deliver many convictions. Victims in this country know that court processes eliminate certain evidence, that there is a different test for a criminal conviction. That is why there are low reporting rates. It is why we have low conviction rates. It is why cases of sexual assault through the courts can take up to 40 weeks to be heard. And when the government goes out there and says that they, uh, the rule of law should be the only way to determine whether an allegation is truthful or not, when it comes to the Attorney General, when it comes to ministerial rep responsibility, it dismiss dismisses the lived experiences of victims. This has brought up so many issues for women in this country and so much anger and so, much, so many memories of things that people have been through in the past. When I was younger, I, my friend and I were at a pub and we saw a friend of her boyfriend. This man had a girlfriend of his own. He was well known and of course he was well liked. When I walked past him, he grabbed me in a way to make it seem like it was a big joke, but I had to push him off me. 
He followed us home and asked if he could sleep on the couch instead of catching a cab. I gave him a blanket and closed the door. My friend went to sleep in one room and I went to sleep in another. I woke up to the so a sound at my door and this man was half naked in the hallway. He came into my bedroom. I asked him to stop. He did stop, but not because I asked him to. He stopped because we heard a sound outside in the hallway. It was my friend. She was crying. She was vomiting. She was crying and vomiting, vomiting because before he came into my room, he had gone into her room. She woke up mid-rape. He left. I called the police. I sat with her until they arrived. I told her she could not have a shower. I gave evidence in court to support my friend. Mutual friends said things like, we will let the courts decide whose side we're on. Parts of my statement were ruled inadmissible because they were prejudicial to the defendant. It was prejudicial to the defence against the charges that he had raped one woman that he may have tried to rape another. I know what happened because I was there. And I know that sometimes the criminal court system does not find people guilty, even if, even if victims believe the truth of what happened to them. So when the Prime Minister goes out there and says that we will let the courts decide on a matter where a victim is just asking to be believed, then victims all across this country know that they have heard these words before. Language really matters. It really matters to victims. Words matter. Words matter like the words of Ms Higgins. I woke up mid-rape, essentially. That's what Ms Higgins said. I told him to stop. It was dismissed. It was played down. I was made to feel like it was my problem. I was failed repeatedly, but now I have my voice. Some words will never leave the victims of sexual assault. The words that they said to try to make it stop, the words that they couldn't get out of their mouths. These words are burned into their brain forever. They can hear when blame gets shifted. They can hear when accountability is avoided. And they can hear when people in this place say one thing, but they really mean another. The victims of sexual assault are listening very closely to the language being used in this place, and they have very trained ears. So far, this is what they have heard from the Prime Minister of this country and the Morrison government. The marches were not met with bullets. Labor politicians are playing politics with this issue. A rape victim was referred to as a lying cow. How our parliament responds to these allegations is under scrutiny right now. Our words are being dissected. So let's not leave any words unsaid. Let's not just say sorry to victims of sexual assault. Let's not just read statistics out in this chamber. We need to find a way to be able to say to these victims, this will never, ever happen to you again. Thank you, Senator Green. I call Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the women, the men and the children of Queensland and Australia, I say violence is never okay. The absence of mutual respect creates space for all forms of violence to appear. At every turn, in our families, our workplaces and in society, we can all be champions for mutual respect and self-respect, looking out for others and doing to others as we would want them to do to us. An approach that singles out only one aspect of the problem of violence will, firstly, never fix the problem and, secondly, makes the work to remedy the problem divisive. There's always just a perpetrator and a victim. Rather than recognising the problem is much more complex than that, these are critical relationships and the people involved need support to find a better way of doing things. 
I reject Senator Rice's attempt to link the gendered violence and sexual harassment to the call for an independent inquiry into the Attorney-General. <clears throat> Both issues must be dealt with separately. It's a desperate, attempt, desperate effort from Senator Rice to address violence by latching onto the current media furor, hoping that somehow that's the way to fix the problem of violence and harassment in our community. It's clutching at straws and greatly diminishes the genuine issues around violence, be it in the workplace, our community or at home. We need reminding that parliament makes the laws, police enforce the laws and judges adjudicate on the law. Parliament therefore has no legitimate position to establish an independent inquiry into whether the, the Attorney General ought to hold that position. That's the scope of the police, not parliamentarians. One Nation rejects violence in any form, in relationships, in families and in the workplace. We need a realistic, intelligent, determined and firm approach to addressing the violence we all know exists. We will, though, never keep the women and children safe by focusing just on them and the transgressions against them. They will become safe when we have the courage and the intelligence to deal with the whole package and all the players. These are often intimate relationships. There's much more than the violence at stake here. We will never keep the men safe either, just by focusing on them and the abuse they suffer. We need even more courage to look beyond our biases and the stereotypes of the nurturing roles we give to women. And to be honest, because one in three men also suffer abuse and violence. They too deserve protection. It's a fact that we will never keep the men safe by vilifying the women. And we will never keep the women safe by vilifying only the men. It's not up to us, it's not just up to the government to address the violence in our family units and workplaces. It's up to all of us to take responsibility for the violence and unacceptable behaviours around us. How we model respectful relationships to our children as parents is the starting point. From there, are we doing what we can when our friends are being ill-treated in relationships? In the workplace, are we standing up against those we work with when they have gone too far? How are we supporting those colleagues who have been the recipient of bad behaviour? And those who behave badly, while it is totally unacceptable, they need support to be a better version of themselves. When we alienate the person because of their unacceptable behaviour, we give up any real opportunity to remediate the situation and we run the risk of entrenching the violence and harassment. Expecting the Prime Minister or government to fix gendered violence and sexual harassment by latching onto the current media furor is an abdication of responsibility that we all have towards each other. It's a cheap and ineffective way to address a gravely serious issue of family and workplace violence and makes things worse. Thank you, Senator Roberts. I call Senator Payne. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Chair, Deputy President. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, this uh, motion from uh, Senator Waters uh, and the Australian Greens uh, raises uh, clearly a number of very important uh, issues, as uh, other speakers have referred to. I also do not agree with or support the uh, joining of uh, the matters relating to uh, raised in relation to the Attorney General in uh, in this re resolution, and I do think that uh, it uh, diminishes uh, the. Uh, addressing of the other issues, uh, Madam Deputy, Acting Deputy President. I wanted to talk uh, this afternoon about uh, the national plan to reduce violence against women and their children 2010 to 2022. It is our key strategic policy and response framework established to build better coordination, long-term effort to reduce violence, including efforts to address the underlying drivers of gender-based violence. We know that violence against women affects the whole community and requires a focus on primary prevention, early intervention, crisis response and recovery. And Madam Acting Deputy President, having been in this place uh, in 2010, when the previous uh, then government of Prime Minister Julia Gillard uh, introduced the national plan to reduce violence against women and their children in conjunction with the states and territories. Uh, my strong recollection of that period of time is a degree of, uh, I won't even say bipartisanship, I will say nonpartisanship across the parliament, across both chambers, across all parties and across uh, all members. It seems to me 
uh, that uh, a degree of that nonpartisanship uh, is diminished, is diminishing uh, in, this, uh, in this place. As part of that national plan since 2013, the Australian government has invested more than a billion dollars to prevent and respond to violence against women and their children. The national plan itself has a strong focus on primary prevention, stopping violence before it starts. Our, the Commonwealth uh, direct investment in the fourth action plan, which runs until 2022, uh, is uh, in the sum of $340 million. It's about uh, funding to improve frontline services to keep women and children safe, funding in support of, um, in support of and prevention measures uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in particular. We do know that primary prevention works, but we also know that it does take time. It is important that it's coupled with well-coordinated responses by the Commonwealth and the states and territories for those who have experienced violence. Uh, the funding for, uh, for operations like 1800 Respect and Men's Line is providing crucial support to women and their children who are experiencing family, domestic and sexual violence and perpetrators who want and must change their behaviour. Uh, in the last uh, uh, 12 months, Madam mm -hmm. Acting Deputy President, uh, the National Federation Reform Council uh, has agreed on terms of reference for the Task Force on Women's Safety under the uh, auspices of the National Federation Reform Council. Previous to that, uh, the women's safety ministers uh, were meeting in the context of COAG, as many will, ref will recall. Those terms of reference for the uh, Task Force on Women's Safety, as agreed by the National Federation Reform Council, I think are very instructive for the way in which we work together in this country. Together in this country as states and territories in the Commonwealth uh, and usually across political divides uh, to address uh, these crucial issues in reducing violence against women and their children. The task force's work will include but not to, will encompass but not be limited to driving and reporting on actions to reduce violence against women and their children under the national plan, uh, developing and implementing a new national plan, including governance arrangements and a consultation process with a national summit on reducing violence against women and their children that was raised with me yesterday in this place by representatives of domestic violence prevention organisations. Monitoring and responding to issues relating to women's safety, including the impacts of COVID-19 on women's safety. And I'm uh, sure that Senator Rustin made reference to the Commonwealth and the states and territories work together, the funding for that during 2020. And respecting and responding to the diverse lived experience of women affected by violence. Uh, I am looking forward, um, Madam Acting Deputy President, to the development of that national summit. Uh, it is something in which many of the stakeholders have a strong interest. Uh, and we will be discussing those plans and the uh, work of uh, all of the jurisdictions at the next meeting of women's safety mi ministers. Briefly, Madam Acting Deputy President, I can also advise the Chamber, Thank as I you. did in question time, Senator that the government Payne. is addressing a number of the Your measures called expired. for in the position. Senator Callagher. Uh, Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And uh, I listened with great interest to the contribution from Senator Payne and Senator Rushton. And I, I suppose what was going through my mind is they're in a fairly invidious position. They both have a level of professionalism, competency demonstrated over a number of years in this parliament. But this uh, urgency motion is the urgent need for the Morrison government, firstly, to respect the thousands of Australians who marched in the Women's March for Justice yesterday. And I think that's where the Morrison government has really let itself down, because the, uh, the Prime Minister's responses since this uh, procession of very ugly um, revelations have come to light has been, well, in my view, quite bizarre. I mean, if, if I had to go back and ask my wife about a second set of circumstances which I heard about in my workplace, I'd probably end up with a thick ear. It is just quite bizarre that you could come out and say publicly, I asked Jen and she said, what about my daughters? What about our daughters? That is a very bizarre statement. And it doesn't get much better. <clears throat> it doesn't get much better. The, the Minister of Defence had an extremely unfortunate uh, uh, series of uh, explanations and equivocations and denials and, and ultimately 
Her own office said enough's enough and started leaking on her. And uh, you know the, the the lying cow stuff is, you know, it's it's unforgivable. It is unforgivable that a you run an office where this is capable of happening. That's unforgivable. And b you can't handle it. Doubly unforgivable. And then you blame the victim. I mean, there are many, many good officers in this place. There are many places where people are treated with respect, where there are proper rules, where harassment is not permitted, not, a, not in any way, shape or form. But to have a minister's office where this, um, this person is capable of being employed and exploiting situations with vulnerable workers is a failure of leadership. It's a failure of leadership in that ministerial office. And a failure to recognise it by the Prime Minister is also quite unfathomable. You have that great honour of leading this great nation. And one thing we know over the years, and there have been many Prime Ministers who have been capable of it. John Howard came up and stood in front of people and said, you're going to lose your guns, because he knew it was right. Here we have a Prime Minister who goes, the rule of law will take care of all this. By the by, you know, some other things going to happen, and I'm not going to investigate it. To the general public, this is very bizarre behaviour from a person they elected to lead them, to lead the nation, and to show empathy and courage when it's required. And I don't think he's shown any empathy, and he certainly hasn't shown any courage, because it might have been traumatic for him to go out there on that uh, steps of parliament. On March the 4th, there may have been people heckling him, but it doesn't matter. You're the Prime Minister. It's your job to lead from the front with empathy, with courage, and state the programs that you've put in place. Defend your government's uh, position. You don't say, oh, you can have a private meeting with me and I'll get you a cup of Earl Grey tea and we'll all put it to bed. Because it's not going to bed. It's not going to bed. This parliament is going to change. And I do say this. There are plenty of officers where really good high standards on both sides of the chamber, any side of the chamber, exist. And those who transgressed should be rooted out and dispatched from this place. If you cannot provide a safe working environment for your staff, you shouldn't be here. And if you need training on that, I don't know how the hell you got here. The first bit of training I had on equal opportunity and sexual harassment was at a course in 1988. This is not new stuff. This is not new stuff. And you know if you've got vulnerable employees that you need to be watchful. You need to give guidance. You need to make sure they're looked after. And there's been a complete failure, particularly in the Minister of Defence's area, to look after her workers. That's unfathomable. Unfathomable to me. And I really do think that uh, you know, the Parliament will change for the better, and the sooner it happens, the better. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. <coughs> I call Senator Thorpe. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to contribute to this matter of incredible public importance and urgency. Safety of our women in this country. I think that's pretty important. Yesterday, thousands of women marched for justice across the country. We marched outside this place, demanding change and accountability from this government, from this parliament, from this nation. We want accountability from all of the self-congratulating men who look at themselves in the mirror and tell themselves that they're good people, while defending rapists in their offices and workplaces. Yesterday, we demanded that the Prime Minister come out and see us, hear us all and act. Instead, he told us that we should be grateful we weren't getting shot. Women of this country heard this. You, can't, you can get raped in this very building, but at least, the Prime Minister says, you won't be shot protesting it. The Prime Minister is wrong again. Miss Joyce Clark, a 29-year-old mother of one and a proud Aboriginal woman, was shot in the stomach while having a mental health episode. 
by a Western Australian police officer who is now charged with her murder. Miss Jew died in a Western Australian police cell. One of the last things she heard as she was dying was a police sergeant, Rick Bond, whisper in her ear, you're a effing junkie. Auntie Tanya Day died in a police cell in Victoria because they refused to give her the medical care she needed after Victoria Police targeted, targeted her for having a couple of drinks and then falling asleep on a train. Miss Veronica Nelson cried this, this, sorry, Miss Veronica Nelson Walker cried out for help twelve times but was ignored. She died in her cell alone. The list of black women who die at the hands of, this, of the state in police or prison custody just goes on and on and on, and, it, and the list will grow longer. Despite this being the 30th anniversary of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, more and more of us are being targeted and imprisoned. Women who live with disabilities also need to be heard. Where's their voice? Given there is actually no data on our sisters experiencing violence. And can you believe the Victorian Labor government wants a treaty with our people, despite it being open season on our bodies? Our women are being locked up more than any other person right now in Victoria. Treaty with that. Black women, we move through the world with the two great big targets on our backs. Not only do we have to deal with the never-ending sexism as we move through the world or even as we move through this very house, but black women, we also have to wade through the never-ending cesspool of systemic racism. The patriarchy hates us much more not just because we are women, but because we are black women, the most underappreciated, undervalued, most disrespected, most neglected and most targeted people in this country. And still we rise. We are strong and we are powerful. We have always been here and will always be here. Yesterday was so uplifting to see so many thousands of people, largely women, come together, united in our message that rape, sexism, violence and misogyny is not a women's issue. It's an issue for our entire society to reckon with. The Black Lives Matter movement is no different. We need all of us all of us who are outraged with the continuing hurt and trauma inflicted on the First Nations people of this country, especially black women, to be part of this change. I looked out on the march yesterday and saw so many people from all walks of life who had never marched or gone to a rally before. We are all in this together, and I look forward to welcoming all of the thousands of women and allies who marched yesterday to our own Black Lives Matter rallies. You know, we show up with you. We ask that you show up with us. If you scanned the crowd yesterday, you would have seen plenty of deadly black women leading the charge. I was there with my colleagues, proud Yamaji Noongar woman Dorinda Cox and proud Waka Waka Wali Wali woman Dr Janara Garang. I was also very happy to see the deadly Senator McCarthy and the member for Barton, Ms Burney, holding up our flag at the rally. Black women, we show up and we speak out. We are on the front lines of all the marches. We are some of the first to turn up for our sisters and allies. Hopefully the Prime Minister keeps his promise and we don't get shot in the street. In conclusion, the biggest irony of the parliament of this country is that it is lawless. Despite the laws coming from this place, the parliament itself 
is absolutely lawless. The thousands of men in skinny ties and pointy shoes and their bosses that crowd these corridors act as if the rules don't apply to them. They act as if they have full permission over our bodies. If the Prime Minister was serious, he would immediately, without any delay whatsoever, implement the full recommendations of the Respect at Work report by Commissioner Jenkins, not just three out of 55 recommendations. WTF for those young people who understand what I'm talking about. So I invite all of those who marched yesterday to join us at the next Black Lives Matter protests around this country, because we fight with you. Come fight with us. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. I call Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The issue of violence against women and their children is persistent, it's real, and it's deeply troubling. It goes to the heart of how many women in our community experience life, because women must be safe at work, at home, in their community from abuse by others. It's understandably emotional. I can see why people get distressed about it. But I want to make a sincere commitment here today to women who are dealing right now with the pain of scars, physical, mental, emotional. We hear you. We value you. And we are working to make things better for you. There's been a lot of politicking on this issue, and I think that's wrong. No party in this place has a perfect record on this most important of issues, and instead of thinking politics, we should be thinking about humanity. After all, those in glass houses shouldn't be throwing stones. But this motion talks about yesterday's march, and in a way, it shows every reservation I had about it. It draws a connection between the march and the desire, quite well held by good people, to see an end to sexual violence, and then tries to use it as an excuse to string up the Attorney General in circumstances where he wouldn't get any of the protections that we would expect, indeed demand, for any other member of our community. Basic evidence, the rule of law, the presumption of innocence, these are not small things. Senator Rice's motion calls for the Prime Minister to listen and to respect those people who marched yesterday. Well, the Prime Minister offered to meet with and listen to a delegation from the march. That invitation was refused. Minister Payne also offered to discuss the issues. That offer was refused. The Prime Minister and Minister Payne offered to sit down and engage constructively with the organisers of the march to truly understand the issues they came to talk about and start working on solutions. Attending a march outside with all the yelling and the cheers and the chants wouldn't have resulted in a productive conversation. I think everyone who's serious about what we do in this place knows that that's true. There is more than one way to listen, to care and to act than to go to a rally. And I have nothing but confidence in this government's sincerity to assist women dealing with this difficulty. So the motion calls for urgent action. So I really want to outline some of the key actions we've taken of late. Since 2013, this government has invested more than a billion dollars to prevent and respond to violence against women and their children. An independent review into Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces is underway, led by Kate Jenkins, our Sex Discrimination Commissioner, and will report by November of this year. We've established 24-7 support services for staff, past, present, in any area for any party. Stephanie Foster, the Deputy Secretary to the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, 
is working with the Prime Minister right now on making sure we can drive cultural change. There's been a lot of talk about the Respect at Work report, and I'm proud to say that's become my responsibility. Already this government has acted upon nine, some people say three in this place, but it's nine, <laughs> nine recommendations of the Respect at Work report, including I'm proud to say we've established the Respect at Work Council and it has its first meeting this Friday. It will be leading the implementation of this very report. We've funded the establishment of online platforms, training and education resources to provide um, the materials that are needed for employers and employees to know how to get the justice and safety and respect that they should have in their workplaces. And we are working through every single one of the remaining recommendations diligently in partnership with government, in partnership with the private sector, to make sure we leave no stone unturned. And we took an active role in developing and ratifying the ILO's Thank Convention you. on Eliminating Senator Violence Stoker, and Harassment. Your time's expired. So much Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It was indeed an honour uh, to join the thousands of people, girls and women, strong girls and women, uh, yesterday who gathered outside this building, along with the tens of thousands who marched throughout Australia. But I'm tired, like so many others, tired of the fact that we are still marching and I'm tired of the fact that women in Australia need to still call for justice. I listened to the contribution of the previous speaker and it's with great disappointment that I remind her that Mr Morrison is our Prime Minister he is the Prime Minister of every single one of those people that marched for justice. And they deserve for him to come out and join them and listen. Listen to what they had to say. These are sad, sad stories <laughs> and indeed brave. But for every one of those stories, can you imagine how many stories are still deep down inside people? that have not yet found a way, for, a way forward to tell their stories. They deep, they, they're deep down and they never go away. They never go away. It will catch you at an, a moment that it just springs up on you, a moment that you would be unaware of. It comes back and again you have to start that long journey to put it behind and try to go on, keep going, because that's what we need to do. That's what women and girls need to do. We can't let, we can't be beaten by this. And unfortunately, unfortunately, the prime minister has taken a wrong turn here. He has set a path for himself that is absolutely the wrong way to go. And so is the, the Minister for the Status of Women, the Minister for Women. I, I truly do not know why they couldn't go out and just listen. That's what people were asking for. It's just, we're talking about People have had some of the most horrific um, assaults made against them in their workplaces, in, out in the community, in their schools, in their homes. And all they were asking is for their representatives, they, the Prime Minister's their representative, the Minister for Women. Are there, is there, are there representatives? They're asking for them to come home, out and listen, to respect their voices, to respect their voices. And quite frankly, I heard one of the, one of the um, coalition members that did um, actually go to uh, the rally 
saying it was really, really exciting to meet the Prime Minister. Well, I can tell her thousands of people were out there willing to meet the Prime Minister, but he didn't show up. He didn't show up. And all those uh, girls, women, and all their, the supporters out there willing for this Prime Minister to show the way forward, because we all know language means everything. His actions mean everything. The way the community enters this debate is based on the way they see their Prime Minister. We know that. But what do we get? We get met with, you know, at least you can do it without, you know, being threatened by bullets. We get, we get, you know, at least, you know, it, the offer still stands. The offer still stands. This is an appalling. If only they could hear what they're actually saying to people. Enough is enough. Thank you. Enough is Senator enough. Senator Brown, I call Senator Askew. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to add my voice in relation to the matters raised by Senator Rice following yesterday's March for Justice. Senator Rice's motion covers a number of issues, so I intend responding to each separately to ensure these important topics are not confused. And starting with respecting the thousands of Australians who participated in the March for Justice, both here in Canberra and around the country. I attended yesterday's rally, along with a number of my coalition colleagues, as I believe everyone deserves to feel safe and supported in their workplace. That includes right here in our workplace, Parliament House. I also firmly support everyone's right to be heard and to protest against injustice. I must admit, however, that I have been disappointed with the way the important issue of workplace safety has been conflated with other matters. Minister Payne stated yesterday that the March for Justice was an exercise in open democracy. That is true, and it is something we can confidently and safely do here in Australia. And I acknowledge everyone who joined the events across the country to have their say. All Australian workplaces, including Parliament House, should be safe for all who work in them. This should not be politicised, and it must be the responsibility of all who work there, regardless of gender, to work together to provide that safety. As you are aware, and as mentioned earlier by Senator Stoker, over recent weeks, the government has taken a number of steps to address the concerns raised by current and former staff and by parliamentarians. And this includes establishing an independent and confidential 24-7 telephone service to support current and former Commonwealth ministerial, parliamentary and electorate office staff and those who have experienced serious incidents in any Commonwealth parliamentary workplace. Announcing an independent review into Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces led by Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins and the Deputy Secretary of the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet, Stephanie Foster, will assist and advise the Prime Minister on how to improve processes to support people, in particular staff, when serious incidents arise. On the matter of ending gender violence and sexual harassment, you will recall that I asked the Minister for Families and Social Services about this topic in Senate Question Time yesterday. As part of the national plan outlined by Minister for Women earlier, the Minister for Women, the third stage of the Australian Government's Stop It at the Start campaign was launched, launched last week to coincide with International Women's Day. Stop It at the Start aims to prevent family and domestic violence against women and their children. Ads for the third phase of the campaign began airing on national television on Sunday night. This is one of the several measures we have introduced to ensure members of the public have the tools and the confidence to call out disrespectful behaviour when they see it. Stop It at the Start challenges disrespectful attitudes and behaviours that can often be learnt in childhood and could escalate into violence if such behaviours are left unchecked. We are asking Australians to speak up if they see disrespectful behaviour. We want people to unmute themselves. Do not ignore disrespectful behaviour and definitely do not excuse it. Speak up and call out disrespectful behaviour. Research shows that four out of five Australians agree that violence against women is driven by disrespectful behaviour. 
We all have a role to play in making sure that every one of us feels safe. This can be achieved by taking small steps and showing respect whenever we have the opportunity. As Senator Rustin said yesterday, we know that not all disrespectful behaviour results in violence, but all violence has started with disrespectful behaviour. Early intervention is key to making sure that all Australians feel safe in their own homes, their workplaces, their communities and online. In relation to the Attorney-General, it has already been noted that it would not be appropriate to hold an inquiry because New South Wales Police has closed the matter. Australian law enforcement agencies are responsible for investigating criminal matters. Under our rule of law, the presumption of innocence applies to all of us, regardless of the position we hold. It is up to law enforcement agencies and courts to determine such issues, not the parliament. And finally, as we have dealt with matters relating to domestic violence, sexual assault and situations where people feel unsafe, I think it pertinent to end this debate by noting that if anyone listening to the contributions today is impacted by sexual assault, domestic or family violence, please call 1800 RESPECT on 1800 737 732 or visit 1800respect.org.au. It is so important to reach out. We all deserve to feel comfortable and safe at work, at home and within our community. Thank you, Senator Askew. Your time has expired. So the question is that the urgency motion as moved by Senator Rice be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it.